Hi, I'm Emily. And I'm Paulus. And welcome to Up Your Arts. The podcast which explores how the arts can enrich your life. Today, uh, I'm doing so well today. That's just taken four takes to get to this point, by yeah, the way. <laughs> quite a lot of giggling, but we actually yeah. have we have a recorded giggling and laughter already. Yeah. Yeah. Keith. Welcome, oh. Keith. <laughs> oh, yeah. How are you doing, Keith? You all right? Yeah, he's had he's had his hair bleached for Christmas, just so you know. Oh, you are. Oh. that's not natural, is it? It's for World AIDS Day. Oh, it was for World AIDS Day. Oh, uh-huh. well done. Round of round of applause. applause. Yes. <laughs> Emily, you and I know each other from the cabaret and burlesque world, as some of our listeners know. Uh, what does 2020 have in store for you and burlesque? Oh, all kinds of exciting things, like new classes, uh, which are starting soon, which I'm really excited about. I love it. Um, and yeah, we've got all of the, I'm starting to get all the new bookings in for the new course, the beginners and the advanced course at the moment. And that's always the exciting time because you just sort of see names coming through and you're like, oh, I wonder what they're like. <laughs> and, uh, and how did you hear about us? So uh, yeah, it's getting into that run up, which is exciting. And you've, how long have you been teaching burlesque for? Um, oh, this is my, um, we're going, uh, this is my ninth year, yeah, because 10 year anniversary is next year, oh. so, yeah, so, yeah, already planning the big party for 2021, I've forgotten about 2020, to be honest, I'm already planning the party for <laughs> 2021. So this year's very much a sort of placeholder until next year's <laughs> 10th anniversary, isn't Yeah, it? exactly. I'm celebrating, uh, 30 years in entertainment this year. 30 years? Yeah, I started... Wow. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Why does that get laughter? Because <laughs> people don't believe I'm that young or that old. I'm not sure which it is. Um, I started when I was very, very young. Before anybody says anything, I'm going to tell you. I started um, producing and promoting and uh, programming cabaret shows when I was 15. And I'm 50. 45 this year. That's how you keep up with it. <laughs> with the <laughs> ageing. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> So I'm doing this special offer, actually, because I train, you know, I train people on a one-to-one basis. Mm-hmm. People come to me for, I'm not a vocal coach or a singing teacher, but I do um, work on acting through song, help people find their on-stage persona, and we do clowning and things like that. And basically anything to do with your craft and your stage act that you need help with, I can help people. So I'm doing this special offer at the moment. I'm Ooh. offering 30% off <gasps> to the first 30 new students who oh, uh, want yeah. to work with me this year. So I might steal that for next year. <laughs> yeah, do, 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 with 10% off for the, the first 10. 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, why not? And now we have got a guest with us today yes, who has do. trained with the both of us. Yes, he has indeed. Why don't you tell everyone who is here? Uh, this is Roman Ackley, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Roman Ackley. Hello. The Wolverine of the cabaret circuit. <laughs> <laughs> I still need to do my Wolverine act, don't I? <laughs> please. Yes, please. That would be lovely. I've been waiting for it. <laughs> uh, the reason we're saying that is because uh, recently you've acquired, grown, I suppose some might say. Sprouted. Sprouted some... What are these called? Um, I think they're mutton chops mutton at this stage. Chops. They were side buns, but they kind of burgeoned. So, so sideburns eventually become mutton chop once they become fluffy enough. And then, is there a third stage? Of- I think they just. Uh, no, I think that's it. I think that you can have mutton chops as big as you like. Um, it's a, it's a, yeti become, after yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose you could call them whiskers. Oh, from yeah. that, the point when you start looking like a raccoon. I think you'd yeah. have to have gout, wouldn't you, if you had whiskers? <laughs> that's that's my plan. <laughs> So tell us, uh, tell us who you are. What's going on? Um, I'm Roman Ackley. Um, so I studied burlesque with Emily, and I've studied singing with you, but I haven't quite uh, started singing on stage yet. <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> oh dear! Oh dear! <laughs> I feel like I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, I'm a um, uh, boylesque and fire and sideshow performer, which I kind of um, I put under the umbrella of being a vaudevillian. Yes. Um, I often do quite um, Victorian inspired performances. Um, uh, I've been described as romantically malevolent um, <laughs> by your <laughs> grand, <laughs> <laughs> um, by a reviewer at the Edinburgh Fringe. Oh, oh. oh and um, as a uh, sinister, lurking, intimate presence by a reviewer at the Adelaide Cabaret Festival. 
which was quite nice. And that was when I was um, I was playing knife games with people for that <laughs> for that act. Of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> what's the uh, What's the uh, age of your creative life? If that's a question you understand. God. Um, so performance wise, only about three years. And you've yeah. already done the Adelaide Festival and the Edinburgh Festival um, and got two great reviews from it. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, sickening. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm aggressively competitive. <laughs> <laughs> and are you actually? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, uh, something I've been talking through with friends in the past couple of months was being a gold star junkie. <laughs> So the idea that like go whenever you embark on a new pursuit, trying to find out what the standards for excellence are, and then needing to have it, <laughs> other before you can like allot yourself any kind of respect whatsoever. Mm. That kind of um, uh, right. What's the best kind of painting? Right. <laughs> Who am I going to study? Like I'm going to try and paint like Vermeer, and then I can have my own creative voice. Because you do, but, you do. Well, I've seen you draw before. Yeah. Do, you, do you paint as well? I paint as well. I've taken a long, long break. Um, but I am currently studying some late 19th century masters uh, and uh, doing some copies. And then at some point, I'd like to start, you know, painting friends and having chat. And I think that would be kind of a dual pleasures. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm thinking of, uh, of paint me like your French women. That's what I'm thinking. About. <laughs> Is that what you're talking well, about? I know. I was thinking more along of you know sitting down, having a chat when I'm painting someone. I've had a um, had a go at that, but I think it's quite hard to get a look likeness of someone when someone's talking. When they're talking, talking. Yeah. Ah, I hadn't even thought about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, you need them to actually stand still. Yeah. But at the same time, you're trying to get them to move because you want to make their eyes look alive as well. So it's. You know, it's a, there's a tension there. Yeah. Hmm. That's quite a skill to it then. I hadn't yeah. thought that through at all. Yeah, oil painting is quite difficult. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wow. Oh, wow. I know, my mind's just blown. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'd never thought of that. Well, I mean, it's also just that I've taken about a 10 year break from it. So I'm mm. rusty. As <laughs> 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 That's a very rusty thing. <laughs> but then you've been very busy, as we, you were yeah. just saying, about being to, going to the Adelaide Fringe. And that was last year, wasn't it? That yes. was last year. And that was, was, it was, the, it was the Cabaret uh, Festival. So yeah. it was in June. Uh, uh, which is Adelaide winter, which is ideal for me because I can't handle heat. I'm, you know, I'm a, <laughs> you know, I go, I go to Edinburgh for summer, you know, I go, <laughs> you know and unless it's cool enough for there to be a, a mist, I'm, I, you know, I, I will kind of <laughs> yes. melt, yeah. <laughs> but you do, you're also doing all of this with a full time job yes. as well. So, like, that's also my mind's even more blown that you, you're studying like the um, art, like painting, as well as doing your sideshow cabaret boylesque it's like i'm like underachieving i need to leave now <laughs> yeah, so it, 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 you yeah being around roman is it's true it's one of those sickening people that just make you feel bad about because <laughs> yeah. yeah. you're also in the gym every day yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. um i think there's those two comments from friends um in the past couple of months which were um so desi monday who's lovely and yeah. moved to toronto and i miss them very much mm. um has said that I'm the definition of overextension <laughs> in that um, I will try and do too many things and cut back on sleep. Um, right. And then occasionally, after a few months, I'll just sort of need to have... You, you sleep. Know, yeah, I'll <laughs> sleep, but I'll disappear for a bit. Yeah. Uh, and then um, my manager actually just said, um, mm, sometimes you know, it's a good that you do a lot of things because otherwise all of that energy would be going into one thing. And I, I, <laughs> and sometimes when you get over enthusiastic about one thing that can, <laughs> um, it, it can be a bit too much. Yeah. So, uh, and, and with, certainly with the gym calms me the heck down because oh. I took a gym break and I found myself doing things like, um, just randomly like crawling on the furniture to try and clean my paintings without taking them down, you know? <laughs> so is this, uh, I mean, without wishing to get mm. too deep, is, is, is this sort of energy mm. or that you have, is, is, is this a, a lifelong thing? That's a lifelong thing. And I have had other friends saying, you're not bad, you're just a lot. You're, you're a just lot. a lot. <laughs> and, you know, and I've sort of, um, and I've, I've sort of munched through that and I kind of thought, my, one of my issues, of which there are many, everyone has a lot of issues, is I'm a bit of a Labrador of a man. 
if you know what I mean, like I, I, I find something and I'm very enthusiastic about it. <laughs> and I'm sort of like, right, you know, <laughs> throwing all of this energy into it. And that's um, a lot of people and certainly a lot of British people find that quite, you know, um, uh, quite difficult because um, um, when someone's just sort of leaping into things and it's super enthusiastic and um uh, you know their voice is going high and low and you know and you've encountered this emily when i've you know <laughs> when i've got an idea in my head uh, um uh, sometimes that does need to turning down and getting back to the arts i think that's one of the things that's great about doing performance is suddenly you can turn turn those filters off and you can be as you know personality dialed up to number 10 as you like yeah. yeah, which is the reason why a lot of my acts have a blast radius. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you explain what a blast radius? Oh, a blast is. radius. I'm like, I'm, I'm being melodramatic, but a lot of my acts have minimum safe distance. Really? Because um, uh, you know, for instance, one of my props is some gauntlets where I shoot fireworks from my hands. <gasps> Okay. I have not seen this act. I want you to say that sentence again just to make sure we've all understood what... no literally please say it again yes. <laughs> so um, uh, they're, they're under the brand name Sparkle Hands <laughs> which to me just sounds far too cute for what they really are uh, which is um, there's some metal gloves yeah. um, uh, that um, uh, you put on and it, you either do like what depending on your cultural references, you describe as the Spider-Man hand gesture or the rock and roll. Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, you shoot fireworks from your hands and it can be up to five, what look like Roman candles for each hand. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's a lot of fire. <laughs> yes. So, just take me back to like little baby Roman, mm -hmm. right? Like young Roman at, at, at like primary school, for example, yeah. before you found out about walking on broken glass and fire acts and stuff like Nails that. Nails in the face, knife games. Yeah. <laughs> right. So... D did, did, did people need a, a radius <laughs> then <laughs> to be a, would that have been wise in the uh, playground? Well, I was, uh, you know, once again, very enthusiastic, but I was very into um, drawing my pictures. Right. Uh, and now that's and, quite and, a sedentary yeah, thing. Yeah, but do. also like running around and exploring and going and looking at things and finding cool animals to look at. And, you know, um, and yeah, I think, you know, in terms of, of that energy it can be very sedentary because it that's directed mm. and i think um so for instance if i when i was a child if i had a nightmare i wouldn't sort of get up and find people i would go and get up and i'd just draw for about two hours even from quite a young age what age are we to um about five six wow, that wow. sort of thing i mean there weren't good drawings because I was. <laughs> were, you, were you drawing the nightmare uh, or were no, you just trying to draw yourself I'd, away from I'd, the nightmare? Um, I'd, you know, I'd just go, right, go back to one of my projects. Oh, okay. You know? <laughs> okay, yeah. You know, um, I'd, I'd create little worlds and things. So, yeah. yeah. As a distraction from the bad dream? Or? I think just because I loved them in and of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, so I, I'd sort of, um, uh, you know, I'd have sort of little projects that would sort of run for, you know, a month or so. And that's kind of the... That's kind of the pattern that I have now, if yeah. you're in terms of um, uh, my act development will tend to be, I'll be absolutely in love with an idea for about six weeks. And then I'll need to, <laughs> I need to rein in other more, <laughs> more um, experienced and balanced people to kind of maintain that love and get it to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm loving the idea of the, um, like you using like artwork mm. as something to help you through like mm. if, if if like the nightmare you can't go back to sleep then yeah, yeah during that act, I, I sometimes I do that I'll I'll get up and write if I can't mm. if I can't if I'm having bad dreams and waking up I'll get out a notebook and write for about um two hours I mean it's all rubbish it's nothing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um but yeah it's uh, it's having that something yeah. a, a tool to express with um yeah that kind of helps calm yeah. the brain down 
So are those a little bit like those are your morning pages, but they're your nighttime pages? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For, for those of you that don't know, the, the idea of morning pages is, is something that was born by uh, Julia Cameron, who wrote The Artist's Way, which is a fantastic workbook, which I oh. recommend to a lot of my students. And uh, and I think that's where morning pages mm. were first born. And the idea is you, when you well, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is to, is to write. I think you're supposed to... What I find really curious about the morning pages is, because I've, I've read The Artist's Way twice now, and at no point does she ever say so she says you've got to rewrite three sides of a piece of paper every morning and you've got to do it by hand you can't text it you can't type it um and I get all of that but she never says anywhere how big the bit of paper is so I don't know whether I mean because I'm very lazy I'm hoping that this little notepad that I got in a hotel room <laughs> is just three sides of that right <laughs> and really big writing but I'm assuming she really means A4 and yeah. I've got to do three sides of A4 but I think it's curious that she never said because she's a clever woman mm. and she left that for, out for a reason so yeah I like the idea of um, nighttime pages that sounds good I used to clean in the, in the middle of the night when I was a student and I was worried about things or I'd had a nightmare in the middle of the night I would get up at 3am and we'd clean the entire flat until 7, 8am wow. and then have a shower and go to drama school I think there's something interesting there about if art's about getting your yayas out if, you know, <laughs> if it's about sort of creating something or gaining some kind of purchase in the world then I have sometimes found that housework can use up your demons before they've you've created something artistic yes so yes. i stopped cooking because i found that i was wasting time cooking you know and, and making a perfectly crafted dinner and that was taking up time and and neurosis mm. that i could more um uh, that would be better used to design some new terrifying thing yeah <laughs> to share with to, <laughs> to share, share with the world with, yeah. Yeah. well of course you could share your cooking normals. with the world as well uh, yeah I, I i could but i use far too most, many anchovies for most people <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're as well as everything else you're too salty <laughs> for, most far too salty <laughs> for most people <laughs> Nah. Can that be my tagline now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're actually me. too salty for most. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it? Do are you a person that um, prescribes to the idea that art comes from neuroses or the bad things that happen to us or the negative things in our lives? I mean, definitely for me, mm -hmm. and then also um, uh, that feeling that sometimes there's just a, a pent up creative drive. And I'm often not too worried about where that comes from, but sometimes I'll get that feeling of, I've got a drawing in me. I don't know what it is, but I can almost physically feel it scratching around inside me. And I need to make that drawing. Otherwise things are going to start unraveling, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I'll start forgetting to do things, you know, um, you know, I, I won't go shopping. I won't, you know, I'll stop sleeping and I'll go, what's wrong? What's wrong? Oh, I need to get at least five drawings out. Wow. Oh. Or I need to design an act that doesn't necessarily have to make it to stage, but I just need to make something. Yeah. So this is, this is the thing I'm really interested in. Is, yeah. uh, um, what about stuff that doesn't ever get mm. shared with a, a wider public, right? Um, but still has value mm. because you're flexing that muscle or because you just need to exercise a mm. demon or just to be doing. Um, and and the, the idea that, I don't know, I've just got this feeling that there are, there are waves of people out there, swathes of people out there, I should say, um, who think that if you go on a training course mm. to learn about burlesque, which you've done, mm. um, that, you'll end up being a professional burlesque performer and do that for a job. And if, and if that isn't the outcome of that burlesque course, then that burlesque course is a waste or, mm. or, or you have failed somehow. How, how do you feel about that, you two? I mean, that's a very, uh, it's a very driven mindset. Um, I think it's quite Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like owning your own house. <laughs> yeah. well, it's, it's like, it's, it's very, uh, 
my art isn't legitimate unless it makes money. Yeah. You know, yeah. this this is um uh, this is labor. I can only justify doing something if it makes a profit. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's like mm, that's if we interrogate that, if we dig into that, that's actually quite a sad way to be. <laughs> because um sure to quote Andy Warhol, art is art of making money is art of making money from art is the finest art there is. <laughs> <laughs> but nice work if you can get it. <laughs> and only 2% of actors actually give up their day job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 2%. Only 2%. Wow. Um, I need to find that stat. It was quoted in The Guardian, so it must be true. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, there was that notable um, uh, actress in EastEnders who has a day job and was uh, was pilloried oh, yes. by the press at the end of 2019 yes, yes. yes. And, and they actually shamed her mm. and it was a horrible thing for them to do because you know what a lot of people have multiple jobs why is it much more shameful for a creative yeah but um in terms of shouldn't they be shaming um the bbc for not paying the actor enough I, I <laughs> not, right yeah, yeah. not in a position to call out the bbc <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am, <laughs> having worked on the BBC, and I can tell you now, she needs that extra job. <laughs> yeah. well, they have this strange rule, you see, the BBC, um, that they've adopted from the, the UN, I think, um, which is called Most Favoured Nations. Mm. So the, I think the theory is that if, if you represent Ghana, Roman, and Emily, you are representing America, and we're all going to a conference, and Keith, you're China, and I'm Uruguay, right? And we're, uh, we're all around this table. Our water... The glass must be the same. Our hotel room standard must be the same. The lunch we're given must be the same. And America doesn't get better. China doesn't get better or anything, right? It's got most favoured nations. Mm -hmm. And the BBC adopted that a long time ago. So when I made All Together Now, uh, all the members of the 100 um, would, uh, they, they would, uh, wanted us to adhere to this rule. So even though on All Together Now, I was shown on camera a lot. I spoke a lot compared to many other members of the 100, some of whom never had their face shown for the entire series. I got paid the same as they did. Uh, now, curiously, Jerry Halliwell wasn't part of the most favoured nation rule, which uh, which I thought was interesting. But I guess they circumnavigate that because she was sort of the co-host as well as a member of the 100. But, you know, in case anyone hasn't heard me say it in public before, that's bullshit. It's utter bullshit. And I, I, I think there's, a, there's many, many issues with it, even though it may well come from a good place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and it ends up with, with issues like like this from that woman from EastEnders, you know. Yeah. Uh, on all the way back to burlesque, yeah, um, and making money from it, mm. uh, and whether people feel like they've not achieved by not making money from it, um, so it's a tough gig. And yeah. The margins are very, very thin, and often there's a very high input because you know you have to have a certain standard um, of skill of costume of, uh, of all of these things. Um, uh, to be able to break through. So I'd, I'd say that's a very hard one and people shouldn't be uh, hard on themselves. I'd also say that any creative pursuit, 95% um, of it's going to end up in the litter bin. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that doesn't mean that those drawings, that those acts, that those dance steps weren't, were illegitimate, especially if you enjoyed it whilst you were doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I can't remember who said it, but there's someone who said that everyone's got 10,000 bad drawings in them. <laughs> <laughs> so I was discussing with my songwriting partner Jordan Clark we're writing a musical at the moment and we were talking about the phrase killing your darlings mm. and uh, and we were talking about not really liking mm. that phrase um, because uh, well, I think there's something really harsh about mm. it on the idea of killing yeah. uh, anything and, and killing something creative and, and we did come up with something something better on the day and of course it, it, it's lost my mind now but we might come up with a new one in, instead today you know <laughs> which sort of says you have helped me get to another place with another piece which is even better and I thank you for that but you know Something that isn't about killing would be lovely. Yeah. But Emily, what do you think about the idea of, you know, uh, monetizing every artistic <laughs> endeavour? Yeah. Well, I suppose, um, going back to when I started in burlesque, the whole reason that I started was just for a, um, a, a hobby. It's just something, a dance class, because I was working out in New Zealand at the time. And um, I had no intention of, like, ever it going any further than what it did. I did 
four courses with the um, uh, with the Hoochie Coochie Girls. And, um, yeah, it was very much on a kind of... They, she always called the showcase night amateur night, the amateur burlesque night. Okay. <laughs> yes. I, I know what you feel about the word amateur, so that's why I put that in. <laughs> so that's another part of this conversation, though, isn't it? What makes someone a professional? What makes someone amateur? You yeah. Know, carry on. Um, but, yes, so... Uh, and a lot of um, the people who were doing that course had absolutely no intentions of um, taking their burlesque any further. It was literally a hobby. You did six weeks, then did a show, and then it was just on repeat throughout the year. And when I moved back to London, I looked for a similar type of class and couldn't find one. And so I taught a few friends and then I thought, well, that's what the basis of my course was always about. It's like it was for people to come along to who didn't who had heard of burlesque, um, who didn't particularly want to become professionals, but wanted an outlet of some sort. Because I think the nice thing about burlesque courses is you've got you're, you're learning and you're doing something different each week. But then at the end of it, um, you're getting to do a show. So you're getting to showcase it as well. But after you do that one showcase, that might be the last you do that act and then go on and do another. So, um, yeah, so that's kind. So I'm very much of a belief that you don't have to go out into the professional circuit, shall we say. Uh, after you've done a course it's like just do it for fun so what makes roman what makes a professional performer a professional (laughs) i've been been thinking about this so um of course i have (laughs) um so the and now you won is the other (laughs) i I think of myself as a professional performer even though you have a day job even though i have this um and i don't think that that's hugely you know i'm um, uh, I was initially shy about that until I found out that stat about most actors, hmm. like like the like basically they're only being a trace of people who are full actors full time. Also, um, there's you know the pension for fire eaters is <laughs> 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 non-existent. <laughs> The the potential aren't knocking on your door. They they don't think it's a particularly safe bet (laughs) as a a group. um, So um, in terms of um, going professional, um, Grayson Perry's got um, a a nice definition, which is turn up, do your hours, be nice. Mm. Mm. Um, And I think that um, certain things that um, mark the difference between someone who's doing it at a as a hobby, which isn't bad, it's yeah. just different, um, and being a professional is, um, if you're doing it as a hobby, it's for you, and you don't necessarily need to worry about, I am putting in X number of hours, I'm um, learning all of these extra things, I've got a plan for what I would want to do, I'm de- delivering a product that's going to elicit a particular emotional response in an audience. Mm. Uh, those might be things that you bear in mind as a hobbyist, but they're optional. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're a professional, you have particular standards for excellence um, that are shared with the producers that are going to be booking you. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be taking the necessary steps to make that happen. Yeah. And you were, and, and, and it colours your judgment, mm-hmm. you know. I remember when I, when I met my husband uh, 16 years ago, I was, I was at the time... Uh, putting together a new cabaret project. And I told him all about it. And my husband's got a degree in economics. uh, And he said, uh, what's your P&L? Have you got, uh, can I see your P&L? And I thought uh, that was very personal because we've just (laughs) met. And uh, and I didn't know what it was. And he he, he said, I mean, profit and loss. Have you got an Excel spreadsheet? I said, no, no, I don't. I've never, I've never opened an Excel document. I don't know. I don't know how to open an Excel document. I only just worked out Word back then. (laughs) And, uh, and, and I mean, I'd literally, I'd never even written down figures on the back of a fag packet back then. Yeah. I just, I, I wanted to make, I wanted to put on shows. It was very sort of, my background as a child, it was very sort of, let's put on a show in the barn, sort of Judy Garland, old fashioned film sort of, oh, look, there's yeah. some velvet curtains, we must do a show. <laughs> let's, yeah. put, let's put them up and do something in between them. Um, and so he sat me down and he helped me make this profit and loss Excel document for uh, the current project that I had. And it was the very first time that anyone had ever asked me and I'd asked myself, OK, so how many tickets uh, mm. can you sell? 
then we assume that that's only going to be 50 percent and how, yeah. you know and how much is the venue costing you and so how much is this ticket going to be i mean my mind was blown by this conversation <laughs> what and magic I, is this I was, I was already 29 and i'd already been doing this for a, a really long time but i i'm surprisingly not made a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> but what it's funny, um, I've been telling this story recently because uh, it must be very clear that I, I, I am grateful tremendously for my husband doing that and he's continued to do that and it's part of our life together and his his involvement in my career and my work. But I am sad that for many, many years afterwards, I rather let that the, the balance of that mm. to, um, get tipped in favour of uh, the, make sure that it's a, making a profit. Otherwise, mm. it's not legitimate. Otherwise, it's not professional. Otherwise, you're not a real uh, working artist. And I think I made some really bad creative choices um, because I wanted to always ensure that it made a profit and mm. it could, I could, I could pay my way through the world by yeah. what I was doing. It meant that I've become one of those those very few people that can say that I, uh, with my teaching and my performing together, yeah. that I, that's, I, I don't have to work in Sano's mm. also. And I'm delighted to say that, but at what cost? <laughs> There's been a big, big period where I, I made some pretty crappy stuff, <laughs> but it paid me, yeah. which is a really strange thing to admit, especially on... <laughs> Uh, microphone. Uh, someone else talk. We can, can, can fix that. Life is falling apart. Here. <laughs> that, that was that was a vulnerable moment. <laughs> sure, no one you. sees these. <laughs> uh, um, we might have to edit that bit. <laughs> um, so I have a relationship with the dip between the different things that I do. Um, I kind of think of the more hobby-ish or the things that aren't going to pay as those are my research and development department. Right, yeah, that's nice. So I, um, I have a, had acts where I've sunk hours into it, knowing that it was just a one-off, and that it wasn't going to pay particularly well, but that it would inform other characters that I was doing. So one of my favourite things I ever did was for Brother, Son, and Sister Moon, and it was a stories night, and um, I read um, Angela Carter's version of Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> And I wore nothing but a ton of fake blood from my lower lip down to my, <laughs> well, to as far as you can reasonably go down the middle. Okay. And um, uh, and then I made an um, audience member brush my hair to calm me down whilst I read them a bedtime story. And <laughs> I'm never going to do that ever again. <laughs> I enjoyed the heck out of it. And that specific audience enjoyed the heck out of it. But... It will inform other clowns and other characters mm. uh, that I have. I'll try and bring that energy to it. Yeah. But it is an utterly unbookable act <laughs> outside of a very specific avant-garde storytelling context. Well, you say that, but I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> you do it now. Yeah. Uh, would you like to come do the uh, Luscious Camera? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the license for full frontal, do you? Uh, oh, well, you see, now that's an interesting thing because um, you've got the um, naked stand-up. Because oh. she's done um, Luscious Cabaret before. And one of the things that she does say is that you don't actually need a license. It's oh. just, um, it's if your audience are going to get offended by it. So if you have that one person who's going to make the complaint right. and be offended yeah. by it, then, then you're in trouble. legal framework super vague, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a bit at a loss here. So... Because uh, uh, so that's why she's able to do the naked stand up in so many venues. Because she doesn't offend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but if somebody's complained, she might get blocked yes. by it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like, but if she had a license and there was a complaint, she'd go, ah, ha, ha, license. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not allowed to be offended. Is that what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. It's, it's, it's like yeah. the Schrodinger's obscenity. <laughs> <laughs> But, does does yeah. this does this um, uh, sort of not having a license and being full frontal thing uh, stop you from creating things or wanting to share things? Uh, how how often do you want to be full frontal? I think so. That um, full frontal, like fire, like knives. You know, it's um, it's a um, it's a color on my palette, mm. um, and it's a very strong one. Um, it's something that some people enjoy and some don't. Um, I also so I also do a lot of life modeling, and um, I'd say that. There's a huge difference between that, um, that nudity rather than nakedness. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and 
reading out a baroque feminist erotic retelling of Little Red Riding Hood whilst naked apart from a load of gore. Yeah. That's definitely naked. Whereas uh, sort of serenely adopting the pose of a disc- discus flower. Th- discus flower? Yeah. <laughs> discus thrower. Discus thrower. <laughs> a a discobolo. <laughs> uh, that's, that's nude and that's very different. Uh, and, you know, I'd, I'd think of those as completely different colours on my palette. And you, t- you clearly think of them as very different words, mm. naked and nude. Yeah. Because yeah. Oh, well, I think that's the thing of, um, if you're nude, there is a fourth wall. Right. Uh, okay. It's just in everyone's behaviours. So quite often with life drawing classes, for instance, you disrobe rather than stripping. And you'll actually get out of your clothes behind a screen. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then put on a robe. And then when you take your robe off, you're not naked, you're nude. But people will actually walk in on you taking your clothes off behind the screen. And they'll go, oh, I'm so sorry. Even though they're going to be looking at you naked for the next two hours. <laughs> Do you know, that's really interesting because I, um, I've recently used the app Urban to book a massage mm. at my home um, a couple of times. And I've had two different practitioners. And both times the same thing has happened. And I've, I, I've noted it with great interest. So um, in they come and they set up the table here in this room. And uh, we have a little chat about, you know, what it is I'm trying to get out of the massage. And uh, I've I've already like, just got my dressing gown on and then my uh, boxes or whatever. And uh, they say, right, I'm going to go to the bathroom and wash my hands now. Mm-hmm. Um, after they've set up the table and and uh, and laid out the towels. And they go in there. And, and I mean, obviously, I hope they are washing their hands before they massage me. But I also think that they're deliberately leaving the room before I take off my robe and lay on the table. Even though they're going to see everything that, you know, because yeah. I turn around halfway through a massage anyway so there's nothing that they're not going to see but there's some seems to be something about the taking off mm. that yeah, that's true. it's ritualistic or personal or, or perhaps sexual for some people that that they've clearly been told by the app i think they've been told yeah. um that they don't that, yeah there's a divide there and you go mm. you wash your hands yeah oh. well it's possible like in massage training maybe that's the thing because they could have washed the hands here in the sink like, here yeah. but they don't they leave the room yeah well i think that's one of the things that's erotic about burlesque isn't it it's the taking off the clothes and you might end up in more clothing than you would have on the beach it's just that the fact that you've taken off uh, your cape and then your o- overcoat and then your undercoat and then your jacket <laughs> yes. uh, and, and of course how you've taken it off <laughs> yeah well. exactly taking the time as mm. well that's that's very key for burlesque particularly is like taking that time in the stillness mm. always repeat to all of my students take your time and be still mm. take because, your time yeah be and, then, still. and then once you do make that movement it's so much more dramatic well i guess that's that's a, you know if if i was uh, an installation in an art gallery uh, and my job was to pick up this piece this glass of water and then just put it down again a millimeter <laughs> further along the table i'd I'd, I'd make a meal of that, wouldn't I? I'd, I'd, I'd <laughs> take my time over it so that you could see my hand and see the glass and see the water and how it moved and then put it down again, even though it's an everyday movement that we yeah. do all day long. Now, I guess that's the difference. Really. Yeah. What, um, uh, Roman, what's your relationship? Being a serial everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was very flattered when you called me a cabaret renaissance man. <laughs> I was incredibly flattered. Oh, by that. good! It was meant to be a compliment. And um, what's what's your relationship with failure and the oh, arts and um, your art? I um, I've been on a bit of a journey with that because um, uh, I um, have historically been someone who hugely reacted very negatively to failure, um, uh, sort of quite you know melodramatically, like collapsing, you know, like almost mourning levels of of um, emotional reaction Mm. Uh, because there was a certain amount of perfection should be the norm and any deviation from what's uh, what's perfect is uh, it is it too personal to ask you where that idea comes from uh, i think uh, so uh my family in general very conscientious people uh so my dad's a fireman and my mum's a nurse and uh there's just sort of so uh, firemen, you know, and nurse, you know, yeah. don't kill people. <laughs> don't kill people. <laughs> yeah. Save people, in and, fact. Yeah. And I think when I said, 
competitive earlier. That wasn't quite the word, uh, right word, because um, there's this idea of there being, you know, uh, there's a standard which should be better than just good. You should be going above and beyond mm. and staying at that cruising altitude. Mm. And I'm eternally th thankful to them for that. You know, it, it can sound like, um, uh, like um, it can sound difficult. And um, I think it's quite um, jarring for most people. But that very uh, wanting to do something that's above and beyond and consistently delivering that mm. um, for that to be built your personal standard is something that I will carry with me for the rest of my life and I'm very thankful for. Mm. Uh, I think it's really, um, you know, perhaps uh, without wishing to over egg the pudding, I think it's really interesting that, you know, you do fire, you set fire mm. to yourself yeah. and, uh, and, and the air in front of you. Uh, and your dad's a fireman and yes. them, <laughs> puts them out. Mm. And, and you have acts where you are covered in either fake blood or, or you create mm. blood from your body <laughs> by walking on broken glass or whatever it is. And your mum wraps up other people's bodies yeah. that might be bleeding. So I think part of that is um, desensitisation mm. um, in that those were both things that were very much in my environment. Right. Uh, so... Um, we had my mum's a chef and <laughs> can't stop eating. So. <laughs> it's the same thing. So, um, uh, so we had a big copy of Grey's Anatomy, the like the Victorian, series one DVD. No, no the, um, uh, the like the Victorian anatomy yeah. textbook for the <laughs> sections. We had um, we had that placed very prominently in the house. My mum would read that because it's a beautiful book, and she'd also um, appreciate it for its artistic merits. So um, I think I probably got my interest in anatomy and in good draftsmanship as a scientific pursuit from that. Um, th and the idea of the human body is an inherently interesting and valuable thing. Uh, and I remember she used to go into rhapsodies about the um, the android and gynoid pelvis, you know, <laughs> these sorts of things. <laughs> These Lord of the Rings characters. Yeah, yeah, I know. Or, or just sort of yeah, like the, sure. the, just the shapes of different bones. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, comparisons between them. And, yeah. Um, and then with fire. Christmas around your house is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, and then the other, um, so with my dad, I was actually... Um, very afraid of fire. Okay. Up until um, uh, I took the course at the fire school, because uh, with uh, Red Sarah. With Red Sarah, yeah. um, and um, I think she knows this. But um, uh, for the record, I've never trusted someone more instantaneously in my entire life. She is wonderful. She yeah. Is. And uh, it was a very interesting moment because um, I was taking this instead of flood therapy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, you know, what, so what is flood, flood therapy is when people expose you to something that you have a, a fear of so that you aren't afraid of it anymore oh i've seen uh, that on this okay. morning with spiders mm. yeah. yes yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and um and i i sort of thought oh, i may as well pick up a skill from it even yeah. if i never use it and i you know I, I i thought that i'd never use it and then i was converted in a day <laughs> <laughs> that was it that fire is for you yeah right? fire is for me yeah. and i think it was interesting because there was this flip of going from thinking of fire as you know having had um you know those those books that the fire service used to hand out that were basically don't pay play with matches or you die so basically <laughs> fire is danger <laughs> fire is danger <laughs> yeah. um and then sort of a shifting to a more adult relationship with fire yeah. oh hang on that means... <laughs> that's, that's, my that's very <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you can't see what we're doing <laughs> Um, so uh, sh uh, shifting to a more Keith, put that down. <laughs> <laughs> shifting to a, um, a more um, scientific, more mature understanding of fire as a chemical process that can be controlled yeah. and um, the risks managed. That was that was interesting. And sort of making the leap from uh, being, ooh, I'm an animal that's frightened of hot things because I don't know what they might do next, to thinking a little bit like being an alchemist. Okay. Of this being something that creates a theatrical effect. Mm. But if I think about it methodically and scientifically, and if I have my 11 page risk assessment, yeah. <laughs> um, all shall be well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. 
I'm going to try and move things on because I've just looked at the time. <laughs> We've been talking for too long again. So, we, the, the Roman, we have to tell you and any, and any new listeners uh, that so there's supposed to be a sort of plan <laughs> as to what we're doing and like a format, but we end up just having such an interesting chat with people. You're the second one now, and and then it, an hour's gone by, and we're like, oh no, we didn't do it. Yeah, never mind. But I suppose um, I, I suppose we'll try. Um, so what is it that really makes you passionate about the arts? So is there one specific area of the arts that you're you're passionate about or is it just the whole of the arts you just love? <laughs> I don't know uh, if that makes sense. So I think we talked about just my compulsion to create. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's not that um, there's anything about the arts that I can sort of pick out that... Um, uh, that draws me to it because it's been there the entire time. I will say that I'm dyslexic. So oh. I learned how to draw before I learned how to read and write. Mm. And um, when I was a child, I used to write in pictograms or I wouldn't be able to learn how to spell <laughs> something unless I could make an image for it. How yeah. wonderful. Um, and so I suppose I have a heavy bias towards images yeah. in the arts. Uh, so, I mean, um, perhaps reframing the mm. question here, um, uh, hopefully uh, helping, <laughs> What, who do you think you'd be if if you didn't have the arts? Well, about 60% of me would be missing, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, some of the rest of the time I work with numbers. You know, I'm, I, I'm quite analytical as well. Um, but, uh, and I need to have that part of me. But art's how I make sense of the world and of myself. Um, it's how I kind of break things down and understand them. And if I didn't have that, then um, I would be, you know, it would be, be like not having my thumbs. You know, I, I, it would be very hard to actually grapple with things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so interested in uh, the fact that you have, uh, we're not going to say what it is, but you do uh, have a day job, as we've said before. And, it, and it's a good one. It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, I would think of it more of a career than a job. And do, do you uh, want it to end so that you can be full-time uh, creative? Or are you, are you going to have them live next to each other? What's um, that? I think for me, they need to live next to each other okay. because I would miss that other 40% of me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which is numbers and... Numbers and... <laughs> Uh, oof. <laughs> how would I describe numbers, infographics, that sort of thing, um, and also I think you, sometimes you need and also stru- wages, wages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah. you need a structure to kick against. Sometimes um, you need a stretcher some, to kick so, against. Yeah, structure, yeah. a structure, a so, structure, yeah. or. Um, I literally thought you said stretcher. stretcher. <laughs> like, uh, is this a football in <laughs> <term? laughs> <laughs> But um, my friend said that um, uh, it. F- yeah, um, uh, they said that it kind of f- fit with my Victorian Gothic aesthetic that I have to have been Mister Je- um, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. <laughs> so I'd say that my day job, um, my look is librarian with a hidden agenda. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's sitting in um, wood panelled rooms, looking very serious and going, "Yes, but what does that mean?" <laughs> <laughs> and then and, and then sort of like scouring people's spreadsheets and going mm, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure that you've brought the level of rigor rigor that the situation requires you know so i, I describe that as my day drag yeah well. <laughs> right and and does the creativity does your creative life help or inform the day job or the other 40% of you. Um, yeah. And they, they cross pollinate. Yeah. I suppose it would be um, a phrase. Um, how? Do you have an example of sort of how the arts has helped the numbers? Or is there anything you can grab hold of there? So, um, certainly with being able to present things. Oh, okay. Um, also, I think that sometimes the, the discipline of the performing arts in that, um, of being able to go right in terms of my personality what am i being at the moment you know mm. am i am i giving people a 10 <laughs> you know um, and, and i think that's the thing of certainly you know in an office environment people's body language is very quiet mm. um they yeah. you know um, often they won't be very expressive in their faces uh and sort of monitoring myself and going oh mm. i know um you uh, you won't be able to see what it's a podcast, but I do talk with my hands like colossally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, someone said I have um, very 
big body language for an analyst <laughs> or a lot of body language for an analyst, yeah. Yeah. someone once said. Uh, and uh, being able to sort of have that awareness uh like it's very uh, um it's very very rarely that someone takes a dancing class to reduce their level of uh physical movement but yeah. by making me conscious of what i'm doing with my body i've been able to adopt you know my day drag yeah, yeah. you know um uh, like the sort of drag king in tweed character that i <laughs> adopt for my nine till six i think you've both uh, i think you've both been on the training course i run called beyond yeah. compare where yeah. i show uh, sir ken robinson's ted talk mm. yes. and uh, and part of the talk is the story of how the choreographer Gillian lynn who choreographed cats not the movie by the way uh, <laughs> the original musical cats um uh, how how she was taken to a therapist by her mum when she was a little girl because she was uh, problematic in class and her mm. mother didn't know what to do she was very fidgety she didn't behave in inverted commas and uh, couldn't concentrate and uh, and the therapist chatted to her and her mum for a little while and then she said to, to baby Gillian oh, okay I'm gonna go outside and talk to your mum for a while and before he and mum left the room he turned on the radio and they looked at her through the door of the glass panel in the door of the uh, uh, at the window with the door and she started to dance mm -hmm. as soon as they left the room she started to dance and he said Mrs Lynn there's nothing wrong with your daughter she's a dancer <laughs> 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 and um, I will say that's something that's um, we went both went on that yeah. dance foundation yeah. course and realizing having spent my childhood running in fields with lurches, picking up hay bales and throwing to the I've got a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sure, the first day after nine hours of dance, it was it nine, eight, eight, eight it hours? It was eight, ago, nine hours. Uh, yeah. And I slept for 11 hours, but the next day I felt absolutely brilliant. And yeah. do you remember by the end of the week, I was. You know, um, uh, the more I expend energy, the more energy I get. Yeah. And I've realised... The are Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the rest of us, the rest of the group, we were all just falling to pieces by really? the end of the week. Roman was all the way. <laughs> I, 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 and I think that's the thing of um, often um, there is a pattern of needing to quieten down and having the discipline to be able to do that, but also think about other outlets. So now at work, um, I've got a standing desk. I do not sit down. Oh, you've got um, one of those funny old, oh, lovely. Yeah. And um, I've trained my co-workers to be okay with the fact that I will do bar exercises. <laughs> because, I was about to say, yeah. are you doing ballet still? Yeah, I, will, um, uh, <laughs> I use the exercises because it's yeah. the only thing that keeps my back in check. Like, fair um, enough, yeah. So this is a great good, example yeah. of how the arts can help somebody, you know, who doesn't want to become an artiste, mm. yeah. you know. Go yeah. to ballet, learn some of the exercises, it'll look after your back for you. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Better than drugs might. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so my, my family have a history of back problems. I have tried everything. I've sunk a lot of money into Alexander Technique, which is good, but the thing that worked for me was do some ballet. Week of ballet, sorted it out. That is brilliant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not going to work for everyone, but that's what worked for me. Yeah. And it, But it does... <laughs> um, it does come across as very strange because you know I'll be stood at my desk typing and I'll be working Do my turn out and playing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I at the now end have of a yes. uh, I'm even more intrigued as to where you were. <laughs> exactly what you occasionally do. Occasionally doing arabesques. <laughs> you know, uh, but but basically, if um, if there's if I've been sat down for meeting after meeting after meeting, sometimes I have 20 business meetings in a week. Right. Um, and you have to, you know, be quite focused in those. And, and clothed. Just, yeah, and, and clothed. Yeah. <laughs> Ex exceedingly clothed. No <laughs> fake blood. I, no I, fake I blood. wear a lot of layers. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this, is, this is the Dr. Jekyll mode. This is the, like, the very um, uh, button down, you know. Um, uh yeah, just be able to go outside and then do an arabesque until you know until something releases. It's quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's so. Ballet's for everyone. Yeah. You see, is that a good? Is that a good, a good time, time to wrap up? up? Yeah, I think so. so yeah. yeah. So, so Roman, yeah. is there anything that you've got uh, coming up that you want to tell listeners about, or where they can find? Uh, so I'm working on a angle grinding act. Oh, oh. So I had a meeting with my armorer. Oh, okay. this week. of course. Well, we've all got one of those. Yes. Keith's got one, uh, an appointment afterwards. Oh, two, you've got two. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what that sign means. <laughs> uh, um, so that'll be premiering in March. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what else? 
Oh, heck, oh, we can put it in the Could bio. You, yeah. <laughs> but I think we both like you to bring back the Red Riding Hood. Um, <laughs> yeah. Keith, what do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. 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 Red Riding Hood, red naked, covered in blood. There yeah. we go. Yeah. That yes. One, yeah, For 2020. Yeah. 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 And uh, <laughs> it, it's social media handles, anything, website? Okay. So Instagram, I'm It's Roman Ackley. Man, that's the main one for me. I, like Twitter is a, is horrible. I'd say yes, that's, it is. I'd say it's a vortex of human hatred, I and agree. I will have none of it. I would yeah. agree completely. Thanks very much, <laughs> Emily. What's going on with you? Uh, what's going on with me? Um, I'm ready to wrap this up. Oh, <laughs> do you not want to tell the listeners anything about um, uh, oh, what's happening? Well. First Friday of every month, Lush's Cabaret. Which I host. <laughs> there you go. Okay. That's where people can find Emily. And and it's I. the friendliest cabaret in town. Oh, Yay. that's very nice. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Roman. Thank, very you. Nice. thank you very much for coming in and chatting to us as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to our guest, Roman Ackley. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this, uh, to give us a follow on Spotify or rate and comment on iTunes. And don't forget to tell all your friends too. Yeah, and you. where can they find us on Twitter? I can't remember the handle. Um, at Up Your Arts. Oh, yeah, that's right, because that's the name of our podcast, podcast isn't it? Yeah, yes. Thank you very much, Little Lady Luscious, <laughs> a.k.a. Emily. And thank you, Paulus. And Keith, the and man Keith. in charge of the buttons. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Loving your hair. <laughs>